At the outset of the Great War, it seemed to be the whole world against Aquitania. The Night Watchmen attempted to maintain the momentum of their initial assault, but by the 29th of January, the Aquitanian capital of Mont de Marsan was already threatened, chiefly by Volkish forces. So, they faced a league of co-belligerents split between communists and the Lateral Pact, and the rest of the more mainstream great powers working together, simply known as the Allied Front. Altogether, this was the Volksreich, Ireland, the Magyarorsag, the Republic of China, Russia, Argentina, North Japan, and FIA Iceland, all aligned against Aquitania. Thusly, Executive Vanguard Yannick Gaio took the initiative and contacted dozens of nations that were notably not at war with them and invited them to an alliance, either by mutual interest or by the promise of plunder and material goods. Several nations responded positively to this offer and promise, establishing the Confédération du Commerce Central on the 2nd of February, 1942. The nations which found themselves a part of the CCC, sometimes called the Triple C, were the Aksu, who wished to be the sole hegemon of Central Asia, Ifriqiya, wishing to halt the progress of communism at any cost, the members of the ancient Paschemi Dal Alliance, including the Madurai, Kham, Kanyakubids, Guj, Koch, Assam, and Bengal, all desirous of various contracts with the wealthy Aquitanians and a chance at developing out of severe destitution. Kazakh, which joined in order to prevent a possibly ascendant Aksu from declaring war on it, Pasai, which sought to claim greater swaths of North America from the Chinese, and finally Colombia, which sought to claim Irish land in South America. And so the scene was set in a more even fashion, perfectly aligned in order to spill the maximum amount of blood. The Aquitanians were able to push back the Volkish counter-strike, turning the Western Front into a stalemate overnight. The Western Front consisted of horrific conditions, artillery pummeling enemy trenches and air support blasting them to oblivion, occasional charges over the top to gain a foot of earth, in short it was hell the world's first real taste of full-scale industrialized warfare. Allied soldiers from every corner of the globe could be found scrambling about in the mud, Irish sharpshooters taking shots from half a mile away, Russian officers barking orders at thousand-man divisions, Magyar machine gunners and tanks pressing the attack, and on the other side countless Aquitanians, fighting tooth and nail to keep what they thought was their right to complete and total freedom. Freedom from state, freedom from regulation, freedom from oppression. Ifriqian ships, meanwhile, shut down the Mediterranean Sea, cutting off a great deal of necessary support to the colonial holdings of the enemy in places like Africa or the Americas. On land, they fought desperately, making no offensives, defending what they held to be their ancient right to honor and aristocracy, fending off a monstrous horde, the Red Spectre of Communism. To the east, in the Republic of China, President Ran Chengye electrified his people to fight by stoking a sense of Han Chinese ethno-nationalism, a function which successfully rallied his massive armies, stirring them to effective war and conflict. Indeed, the Chinese army was the first beyond Europe to take action, flooding into the Triple C bulwark of Central Asia, engaging in brutal mountain conflict. The Chinese were at a distinct disadvantage in this theater, largely due to the sheer elevation of the place. The Chinese army experimented with air support, but found the higher peaks too dangerous to fly over, and also experimented with portable oxygen tanks for the soldiers, though these were discontinued as soon as enough of their men exploded in a fiery blaze because their O2 tank was shot. The soldiers of the Paschemi Dal darted amongst the mountains, causing rock slides, launching night raids, and committing to gas attacks, while Chinese forces were in low mountain passes. The Chinese, however, fueled by their ideological fervor, were cruel in their tactics. They viewed their enemy as subhuman, and so did what they pleased with those they captured. One of their most effective psychological tools was the Shan Diao, which was a pun as they weren't carving mountains, but rather people in the mountains. Shan Diao was when a prisoner was captured. He was not killed until nighttime, during which they would carve him up, stripping pieces off of him and mutilating him until he died. Paschimidol soldiers often fled to try and escape the sounds, but they echoed far across the mountains. Those few soldiers that were sent home for severe injuries were never the same. 
An archetypal battle of the Central Asian theater was the Battle of Kathmandu, where the Chinese managed to chase the mountain soldiers into a regional city, sparking a siege that would last the rest of the war. Occasionally, the Paschemi Dol would launch their dead and dying over the walls in order to infect the Chinese with disease and attract flies to their camp, while the Chinese occasionally sent small groups of men in the night over the walls to kill civilians, though these men all died before they could fling the gates open from within. Meanwhile, the northern passage through the Gobi Desert was going better for the Chinese, and was mercifully more conventional for the Aksu and Kazakhs. These two nations were comparatively primitive, and they patrolled the desert with cavalry. When the Chinese arrived, a particular pattern was established. Hemmed in by mountains and foreign borders, the Chinese would achieve a victory against the Aksu Kazakh horsemen, who would then flank and harass the Chinese until they were forced to halt their advance, retreat a few hundred feet, and set up camp. This would be the format of 25 battles, and would later be romanticized in the mind of the Chinese public as the 25 Battles of the Gobi Desert, of which books, poems, and movies would be made. The Russians also participated here, bearing down hard on the Siberian holdings of the Aksu and Kazakh. The Russians, well versed in combat of this sort and natives to that terrain, were able to secure victory after victory as the Aksu front shrank day by day. The Aksu dedicating all their resources to holding back the Republic of China in the east. The defining battle between the two was the Battle of Tobolsk, where the Aksu Kolgaknar, the Russian minority in Aksu, were led to fight the Imperial Russian army in the small town of Tobolsk, which lay on an important source of fresh water. The battle was evenly matched for many days, until the fifth day, when the Kolgaknar slaughtered their Aksu officers and joined the Russian side. Southeast Asia was dominated by naval warfare, namely Pasai ships attempting to sever Chinese access to their American territories, and for the most part they were successful, the Republic of China traditionally a land power, unable to project itself very well or very far beyond the waves. This was established by the Great Hawaiian Blockade, when a flotilla of Chinese supply ships attempted to reach and dock in their territory of Hawaii, but they were cut off by a battalion of Pasai ships. Without Hawaii as a refueling point, China would have to make a much costlier journey to the west coast of North America, if indeed they made it at all. The Pasai ships surrounded Hawaii, and the Chinese ships sat there and tried to destroy them. The two groups attempted to destroy each other all night, Chinese sailors even swimming over and attempting to assassinate everybody on board one of the Pasai vessels, though they were apprehended after only 13 deaths. Eventually, the Chinese ships had to turn back, and after a few months of back-and-forth fire, Chinese planes even being shot out of the sky, the people of Hawaii starved, one and all. Africa was bloody, though it looked more like a series of riots than a theater of war. Ifriqiya was utilizing guerrilla tactics and local mercenaries, scheduling them to attack and harass locations in Irish Central Africa and Magyar South Africa. They even mobilized a mob of Malian citizens to flood into Irish West Africa, armed with cheap guns and rumors of harsh slavery. The Afrikians were masters of division, and even where their yellow-ribboned pith helmets were nowhere to be seen, their hands were moving people across the continent like pawns across a chessboard. The Magyars resorted to the wholesale slaughter of native populations in the hopes of discouraging insurgency, and the Irish made their colonial apartheid system more strict, to the point where local groups had absolutely no contact with Irish settlers and farmers. This played directly into Afrikian hands, as it lent credence to the rumors they spread amongst the natives. Knowing they could never overcome the colonial administrations, they regardless achieved their goal of shoring up colonial resources in the dark continent, far and away from the significant fronts. North America was electric, though all of the gains made by both sides in the Midwest and Northeast were undone the next week by the opposing side. As such, nothing really moved, and progress for anybody proved elusive here. The Aquitanian Night Watchmen were particularly successful in protecting the territorial integrity of Aquitanian Quebec, and so it became a rather peaceful place to live during the war. Anyone who tried to brave the forests of Maine or cross Niagara never returned, because the Night Watchmen were in the trees, waiting for foolish victims to make the journey. The bloodiest fronts were the fronts with China, Afrikian malice met with Chinese fervor, 
meant that the Rockies ran red with blood, though much like the other American fronts, not much changed apart from the number of living people. The Alaskan front between Pasai and China was part of the reason the Chinese hadn't already taken the Great Plains, because in the frigid cold and the virgin snows, countless soldiers poorly conditioned for Arctic combat died in the thousands, firing at each other across a straight front line with almost no visibility most of the time. The Pasai would have been able to charge over the line more effectively since the Chinese were undersupplied due to the Great Pacific Blockade, but the presence of the Volksreich in the Aleutian Island chain meant that they couldn't totally expose their underbelly, lest their entire offensive fall apart. North America was perhaps best described, then, as a house of cards. Finally, South America was hellish. Colombia was totally outnumbered, outgunned, and outclassed by Irish South America, but supported by the Aquitanian Antilles, they were able to keep going. Colombia was a desperate country, an idealistic republic with a thousand dreams, unfulfilled in every respect, destitute for centuries. This war presented them with the opportunity to claw their way out of the situation that their country had found itself in since its conception. Guerrilla raids were sent into the Amazon and became like constant festering sores. No matter how hard the Irish tried to dislodge them, it was decidedly not enough. Argentinians then joined the fray in a similar manner, though they couldn't exactly dislodge them either, leading to almost a civil war within Irish South America that they had no control over. Only the cities were safe, though even then the Aquitanian bombing runs coming from the Antilles devastated them, leaving only the most stubborn of them to remain. The Yusufids, meanwhile, reaped the benefits of the Great War, which was ravaging a world they had not truly been a part of for centuries by way of dealing guns and other implements of war to anyone looking to buy. Island hopping in the South Atlantic and Indian Oceans ensured the security of their illicit goods, and connected impoverished arms manufacturers in Brunei and Chabance with the deep pockets of the great powers. The world looked like this for the better part of a year, the greatest nations locked in a life-or-death struggle with one another, claiming over 10 million lives by the 20th of November, 1942. On the 29th of November, 1942, a breakthrough occurred due to a total alignment of Allied forces. Piercing the Aquitanian line with Magyar tanks and Volkish men, the Aquitanian capital of Monte Marsan was totally overcome, captured without a siege by the Volkish Red Army. President Gallo fled to Madrid, leaving his capital to burn. Fighting across the Pyrenees meant that large Magyar military hardware couldn't cross, so the Volkish Red Army crossed with Magyar equipment while the regions around Monte Marsan were brought under control by the Arbeiterkorps, Volkskommissar Albrecht Riemensberger being particularly unyielding in his enforcement of order. Controversially, he ordered all crops from the region be immediately harvested for sale, and all stockpiles exported for the benefit of the revolution publicly executing those found guilty of hoarding food by way of hanging. Back on the home front, the war was consuming resources at a rate Volkish production couldn't compensate for, especially in the realm of agricultural production. As such, Chairman Leon Beck commanded that all farms in the country be collectivized, so that the Central Planning Committee could determine exactly how much food needed to be produced, eliminating unnecessary crops and punishing counter-revolutionary behavior. All land was also seized by the state, and farming plots were redistributed evenly across the impoverished rural classes by way of scientifically determined farming practices and equity calculations. Those who resisted their crop assignment were either relocated if there is someone else with the same complaint working their preferred crop, but most of the time they were simply told to farm what they were told or work in a steel mill. A widespread joke at the time was, why do Volkish schools have more than two subjects if there are only two jobs? Praxis Boftragt or Joseph Rathenau declared this joke counter-revolutionary and punishable by conscription. Bread rationing was soon thereafter instituted by the Central Planning Committee in order to artificially decrease demand and so production could keep up. By 1943, due to the minefields and traps that laced their footpaths and handholds, the Pyrenees were nearly impossible to cross. It was not uncommon for a climber to get his hands blown off by a mine, or for a whole company to be crushed to death by falling rocks. Unsurprisingly, Aquitania imported some men from its allies in the Paschimi Dal to aid in this mountain warfare. Though, despite the bloodshed and trickery, these mountains were not enough to contain the sheer amount of Volkish soldiers who were able to drive through them and in some cases sailed around them. 
though it was almost impossible to get past the Aquitanian naval blockade. But eventually, once these obstacles were overcome, Madrid too was captured, and Aquitania was soon thereafter exiled from Europe. Yannick Gaio also fled, setting up a new headquarters in Montreal, which he fortified in an extreme manner through the power of Aquitania's still immense industrial capacity. Turrets could be found dotting every few feet surrounding the city, even on the tops of churches and residential properties. The land was heavily mined, and all who came and went were regulated by a strictly guarded fence and gate system. Anti-air batteries mounted on the backs of trucks also roamed the surrounding countryside for five miles in every direction, and members of the night watchmen were couched in the trees for 12-hour shifts. Meanwhile, the fledgling communist insurgency in Colombia failed, and the Japanese Civil War remained in total stalemate. Due to a lack of ammunition coming in on either side of that civil war, they had resorted to melee combat, where over a million men had died by way of bayonet alone. On the 5th of January 1943, the Aquitanians went on the offensive in North America, hoping to carve out a more defensible position for themselves. Thus, when the Irish were faced with them, they tried and failed to keep them back. When the commander set to handle the North American front, General Burkhard von Schwarzburg, heard that the Aquitanians were making gains in North America, he planned a grand naval troop movement, with the goal of landing in St. Louis in Volkisch America, and setting up a front line against the Night Watchmen, eventually pushing them back to Montreal. Meanwhile, the Sege no Zensen continued on, stalwart in their defense of Hokkaido. Though the bad news for them was that it was, by then, no longer an evenly matched civil war. It was indeed only a defense. By 1944, tens of thousands of Volkish troops were loaded onto Irish troop transports and sent to the North American front. Only the Arbeiter Corps was left in the Volksreich proper to ensure security and enforce ongoing reforms. Due to the complications involved with administrating the largest war in history, command of the Arbeiter Corps was temporarily shifted from Volkskommissar Riemensberger to Praxis Boftrag to Rathenau, so that Riemensberger could focus on the Western Hemisphere alongside General Schwarzberg. This move proved especially significant because of the fact that Chairman Beck's reforms were proving rather unpopular, and they needed to be supported by force. Rathenau brought up the issue of ideological purity to Beck, saying that the people need social reform as much as they need economic reform, and that the reason they are unhappy is because of this ideological inconsistency. They indeed still wore their old chains in what was supposed to be a new world, if only because they knew and understood them. Rathenau proposed that they shutter the churches in line with Marx's original theory, and convert them into spaces for the public good, as well as purging academia and ensuring the press did not disseminate counter-revolutionary rhetoric. Chairman Beck denied these measures, saying that real reforms, not the useless theorism he suggested, would get done when the war was won. The Leonists rallied around him, and in response, the Rathenites began to quietly execute orders on behalf of Rathenau, even joining the Arbeiter Corps under false names and masks in order to sway the militia leadership in favor of Joseph Rathenau and his ideas. Soon enough, churches were catching fire and printing presses were having their machinery apprehended, the latter supposedly for the war effort. In June, meanwhile, the Great Volkish March up the eastern seaboard had forced the Night Watchmen out of Volkish America, and the battle for Montreal began. The entrenched forces of the Aquitanian Watchmen fought hard against the Red Army, and the siege lasted most of the year, reducing the surrounding Canadian countryside to barren wasteland. Neither side was breaking, and it seemed would not break. This uncertainty was poison for the other members of the Triple C and the fronts they were fighting on. Russia had occupied all Aksu territory north of Sogd, the Republic of China had shattered most resistance in the Paschimi Dal and had entered the Indian subcontinent, the apartheid systems made colonial subversion too expensive for Afrika to maintain, so they began to languish, losing control of the continent. The Pasai lost control of the Pacific due to a truly terrifying naval invasion of Hawaii by a combined Chinese-Russian force, giving them back an empty Hawaii to use as a refueling point and airbase, and Colombia found itself consumed entirely by the insurgency that they started. The Republic gradually subverted and carved up into territories controlled by gangs and militias. The Irish funded them, stoking anarchy there. 
In August, Irish forces conducted a naval invasion of their own in Aquitanian Quebec, headed for Montreal. In September, Chinese forces came from the west, overcoming Afrikia and joining the siege. On the 12th of September, Hokkaido fell, and the Sege no Zensen was no more, Chairman Kenkichi Togo executed by beheading. On the 15th of September 1944, combined Volkish, Irish, and Chinese forces broke the defenses of the Aquitanian Night Watchman. Yannick Gayo, president of Aquitania and head of the Defat Le Quartier, committed suicide in his provisional Montreal bunker. The Treaty of St. John's was signed over the course of the next week, a treaty that cost 70 million lives lost over the course of three years. The Volksreich took all Aquitanian territory in Europe and puppeted the small country of Pequot that they had under their control in North America. Ireland puppeted what was left of Aquitania in North America and annexed their African colonies, relegating them to that continent and installing Pierre Perón of the Democratic Socialist Party as the president of a new republic, as well as changing their flag back to the pre-revolution blue shield with white stripe on white background. All of this much to the chagrin of Volkish negotiators. The Republic of China devastated the Paschimi Dole, annexing Kham, Guj, Assam, and over half of the Kanyakubids, as well as a great deal of the Gobi Desert from Aksu, and the rest of the West Coast, including Alaska, the Southwest, and part of Northern Canada. Russia's gains, however, were perhaps the greatest of the Great War. Russia totally annexed Kazakh, as well as all Aksu territory north of Sogd, putting them in a position of terrifying might. The Magyar Sog was to receive reparations from the members of the Triple C, and Argentina was allowed to puppet Colombia in the north, making them a constitutional monarchy under Juan Jiménez III, though the ongoing insurgency was never going to truly clear up. Ifrikia was also made to pay reparations to the Volksreich and relinquish Kaiser Erhard VIII. The world was at peace once more, and winds seemed to whistle quiet over the charred and ashen battlefields. Things seemed indeed too quiet. Anxiety lingered like a whisper in the distance. The war was over, wasn't it? As Volkish troops ensured that order was maintained in North America, and the Arbeiter Corps stood guard at the nation's borders, there was a restlessness about it all. In November, a series of nations in quick succession dropped out of alliances and cancelled ties with the Volksreich, grain subsidies set up during the war failing and sparking famine due to troubles organizing the output of collectivized farms. Chairman Beck began to suspect that there was a conspiracy to sabotage the revolution from within, and ordered Praxis Boftrag to Rathenau to conduct a purge of the Arbeiter Corps. On the 10th of November, 1944, Chairman Beck received a telegram from his border watch, but was seized by a group of Arbeiter Corps officers before he could read it. He was wrestled to the floor and stabbed 23 times. Praxis Boftrag to Rathenau coldly commented on the importance of saving bullets, and sat down at the chairman's desk to contact Volkish America to organize the return of the Volkish Red Army to the homeland, when he stopped to read the new telegram that came in. The one word printed there disturbed even his cold demeanor. It simply read, Russians. <laughs>